Hello, hello. She's back again. Lisa Marie with the greatest miracle in the world. I got my new book yesterday. Thank goodness, because this is what the old copy looks like. It is in literally in pieces. And so I had to order a new book. That's what happens when you have a 100-day challenge and you are on day 77. So the book got a little worn. So I'm going to pick up where I left off yesterday and just to backtrack a little bit so you can remember where we are at. Um, Augmentino saw Simon's uh, book collection, uh, you know, all the books and and his belief in what happened that that maybe man gave up on God thinking that he really wasn't still alive. So anyway, I'm going to pick up from that spot. We are on chapter two, page 13, if you are following along. Okay. So what's the greatest miracle in the world that we all can perform? First, Mr. Og, can you define a miracle for me? I think so. It's something that happens contrary to the laws of nature or science, a temporary sus suspension of one of these laws. That is very concise and accurate, Mr. Og. Now tell me, do you believe you are capable of performing miracles, of suspending any laws of nature or science? I laughed nervously and shook my head. The old man rose, picked up a small glass paperweight, from the coffee table and held it across to me. If I release this weight, it will fall to the floor. Is that not true? I nodded. What law decrees that it will fall to the floor? The law of gravity. Exactly. Then without warning, he let the paperweight fall from his hands. Instinctively, I reached for it and I caught it before it hit the floor. Simon folded his hands and looked down at me with self-satisfied grin. Do you realize what you have just done, Mr. Og? I caught your paperweight. More than that, your action temporarily suspended the law of gravity. By any definition of a miracle, you have just performed one. Now, what would you judge has been the greatest miracle ever performed on this earth. I thought for several minutes and probably those cases where the dead have supposedly come back to life. I agree, as would a consensus of world opinion, I am sure. But how does this all connect to those books you got piled up? Certainly they don't contain any secret method, methods on how to come back from the dead. Ah, but they do, Mr. Og. Most humans in varying degrees are already dead. In one way or another, they have lost their dreams, their ambitions, their desire for a better life. They have surrounded their fight for self-esteem, and they have compromised their great potential. They have settled for life of mediocrity. Days of despair and nights of tears. They are no more than living deaths confined to cemeteries of their choice. Yet they need not remain in that state. They can be resurrected from their sorry condition. They can each perform the greatest miracle in the world. They can each come back from the dead. And in those books are the simple secrets, techniques, and methods which they can still apply to their own lives to become anything that they wish to be and to attain all the true riches of life. I didn't know what to say or how to respond. I sat there just staring at him until he broke the silence. Do you accept the possibility of individuals performing such a miracle with their own life, Mr. Og? Yes, I do. Do you ever write about such miracles in your books? Sometimes. 
I would like to read what you have written. I'll bring you a copy of my first book. There are miracles in it? Yes, many. When you wrote it, did you feel the hand of God upon you? I don't know, Simon. I don't think so. Perhaps I shall be able to tell you after I have read it, Mr. Ogg. We sat after that exchange in a stillness interrupted only by the occasional rumble from a truck or a bus bouncing along the ruts of Devon Avenue. I sipped the sherry and felt more relaxed and at peace with the world that I had in many months. Finally, I placed my glass on the small polish and table next to my chair and found myself staring at two small photographs, each enclosed in a small brown frame. One was of a lovely brunette woman and the other of a blonde male child in military uniform. I glanced at Simon and he sensed my silent question. My wife, my son. I nodded, his voice now so soft that I could scarcely hear, er, scarcely hear him, seemed to float across a small room to me. Both are dead. I closed my eyes and nodded again. His next words were barely a whisper. De show, 1939. When I opened my eyes, the old man had his head bowed and his two giant hands were clenched together tightly against his forehead. Then, as I, if embarrassed that he had momentarily exposed his grief to a stranger, he sat up and forced a smile. I, I changed the subject. What do you do, Simon? Do you have a job? The old man hesitated for several moments. Then he smiled again, spread his hands in the self effacing gesture and said, I'm a rag picker, Mr. Og. I thought rag pickers disappeared with the soup kitchens and hunger marches of the early 1930s. Simon reached across, placed his hand on my shoulder and squeezed it gently. By definition, Mr. Og, a rag picker is one who picks up rags and other waste materials from the streets and junk heaps to earn a livelihood. I would imagine that sort of rag picking has almost disappeared from the American scene during these years of nearly full employment, but we could see them again if conditions change. I doubt it. Our crime rate seems to be telling us that we've discovered faster and easier ways of laying our hands on a buck, like mugging, arm robbery, burglary, I'm afraid that what you say is true, Mr. Og. Still, in this day of soaring prices for paper and metals, I would imagine that a rag picker or junk man could do quite well for himself. However, I am not that sort of a rag picker. I seek more valuable materials than old newspaper and aluminum beer cans. I search out waste material of humankind people who have been discarded by others, or even themselves, people who still have great potential but have lost their self-esteem and their desire for a better life. When I find them, I try to change their lives for the better, give them a new sense of hope and direction, and help them return from their living death, which to me is the greatest miracle in the world. And of course, the wisdom I have received from my hand of God books has helped me immensely in my, what shall we call it, profession. See this wooden cross that I often wear? It was carved by a young man who once was a shipping clerk. I ran into him one night on Wilson Avenue, or whether I should say he ran into me. He was intoxicated. I brought him here. Every several pots of black coffee, a many, a cold shower, and some food, we talked. He was truly a lost soul, nearly crushed by his inability to properly support his wife and two young children. 
He had been working at two jobs more than 17 hours a day for almost three years, and he had reached the breaking point. He had begun to hide in the bottle when I found him, trying not to face his living death in a conscious that was telling him he didn't deserve his wonderful young family. I managed to con convince him that his situation was common and far from hopeless, and he began to visit me nearly every day before he went to his night job. Together, we explored and discussed many of the ancient and modern secrets of happiness and success. I imagine I touched every wise man from Solomon to Emerson to Gibran, and he listened carefully. What happened to him? When he had a thousand dollars saved, he quit both jobs. He packed his family in their old Plymouth and headed for Arizona. Now they have a tiny roadside stand just outside of Scottsdale, and he's beginning to command fairly large prices for his wood, wood carvings. Now and then he writes, always thinking, thanking me for giving him the courage he needed to change his life. This cross was one of the first carvings. He's now a happy and fulfilled man. Not any richer, mind you, just happier. You see, Mr. Og, most of us build prisons for ourselves. And after we occupy them for a period of time, we become accustomed to their walls and accept the false premise that we are incarcerated for life. As soon as that belief takes hold of us, we abandon hope of ever doing more with our lives and of ever giving our dreams a chance to be fulfilled. We become puppets and begin to suffer living deaths. It may be praiseworthy and noble to sacrifice your life to a cause or a business or the happiness of others. But if you are miserable and unfulfilled in that lifestyle and know it, then to remain in it is hypocrisy a lie, and a rejection of faith placed in you by your creator. Simon, forgive me, but does it ever occur to you that perhaps you should not interfere in the lives of people or that you have no right to do so? After all, they're not out there looking for you. You must find them and then convince them that they can have a new life if they are willing to try. Aren't you trying to play God? The old man's face softened in a look of sympathy and compassion for my apparent lack of perception and understanding. Yet his reply was brief and forgiving. Mr. Og, I am not playing God. What you will learn sooner or later is that God very often plays man. God will do nothing without man, and would, whenever he works a miracle, it is always done through man. He rose as if to bring our visit to an abrupt end, a technique I have used frequently at the office if it was at my best interest to terminate an interview. I shook his hand and I stepped into the hallway. Thanks for the hospitality and the sherry. It was my pleasure, Mr. Og, and please bring me a copy of your book when you have a chance. During that long drive home, one question continued to intrude itself into my thoughts. If that wise old rag picker specialized in rescuing human refuse, why was he wasting his time on me? An affluent and successful company president in the 50% tax bracket, who had just written a national bestseller. Okay, that concludes chapter two. Uh, I am not going to absolutely promise I will be here tomorrow with chapter three, but the next time I am live, it will be with chapter three. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, anybody wants a copy of the God Memorandum, which is chapter nine of this book, 
please reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to share that with you. Um, I don't have a copy of the whole entire book that I can share, but you can easily get that for like $7.99 on Amazon. And it's worth its price in gold. So, all right, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching. If you did for a minute or whatever, I appreciate you. Have a great night.